Hello learners, welcome to session two of designing presentations. In this session, we are going to focus on slide enhancers, meaning anything that takes your slide up a notch. Once you've created your graphic language, you figured out the look of your presentation, you can then go on to enhance the slides using various techniques that we will learn in this session. So the learning objective, like I said, is going to be about making your presentations dynamic with slide enhancers. And also we're going to talk about how to find the correct references uh, for your PowerPoint. We want to be able to find the graphics from where you take inspiration to finally make your presentations, to finally use the tools that we have already learned about. So like I said in the previous session of graphic language, slide enhancers are things that are not necessary. They're not the basic necessity of a presentation, but it does take it up a notch. So imagery, animations and transitions, and also media that you use from uh, sound to videos that you use to make your presentation super dynamic. Let's start with images, where to look for images. So there are websites uh, online where you can uh, find uh, copyright free images. Of course, we look at Google and uh, we can find high resolution images, but not all of them are copyright free. You might be sharing your content on uh, social media or uh, places where you need that copyright. So please go online and search for websites. There are websites like pexels.com and uh, unsplash.com. Um, also freepick. Freepick is F-R-E-E-P-I-K. I will put all of these references in the end of this uh, session. But you can go to these websites and find the kind of images you want for your presentation, all copyright free, and you find the licenses when you download them. So try and find good images uh, for your presentations. Now, how to use uh, imagery in your uh, presentations? There are four things that we're going to learn. Uh, two of them we've actually already covered, but I will skim through them once. Uh, we've learned about how you can place image inside text. You can also place image inside shape. So you can give an image a particular shape that you like. Also, how can you innovatively use image images as a texture? So how you overlay two images to use one of them as a texture for your presentation and also how to use image effects and the presets that you have. Let's start with images inside text. So say you have a word literally on your screen. And I'm going to show you how this works. So we have a word on our screen. And what I want to do is I want to place an image inside this word. What we do is we go into text fill. And so we see text fill. And it has something called picture under solid gradient and uh, you have something called picture. So we go to picture and then we can specify the source of the picture that we want to use. So we'll go to file and I will just pick up a random picture. Okay. And there. So I have the photograph inside my word, right? The other thing that we learned was how to put uh, pictures inside a shape. So the same way that we did a picture fill in text, we can do a picture fill in shape. All I have to do is shape fill and I go to picture. It just picks up the previous picture as a preset right now, but you can change it again from picture source. You go to insert from a file and then you can change the picture that you want to put inside the shape. Another way of doing it is where you bring a picture on your slide and then you go into crop. So 
So under crop, you have something called crop to shape and you can crop it to any shape that you like. So it could be a hexagon, it could be one of these arrows. And now my picture is inside the shape, right? So we've already learned how to put pictures inside shapes and text. Once you've found the images that you want to use in your PPT, how can you edit them, right? So I have an image here uh, that when I click on it, it opens up in a picture format. And there are a few things that you can do with an image, right? You can crop it. Uh, you can give it a border. You can give it shadow. And everything that we've learned in uh, shapes and text. Uh, what you can also do is there are these presets here that you have, right? But I urge people not to use these presets firstly because you can recreate these presets. So if I have to recreate this particular preset, the image is just in a circular shape, which you know how to do when you go to crop to shape. It has a border which you can give as outline. But what it also does is these presets reduce the quality of my image. So if you clearly see right, right now it has a preset and now it doesn't. The picture quality reduces massively. Now, when you are making presentations and you end up making a PDF out of them, uh, the picture quality reduces there as well. So it's better not to use these presets because it instantly reduces the picture quality. Okay. I would say you should just try and recreate what you want to do. Anyway, you should not use these kinds because they make a PPT very cluttered. You know, it should be very simple. That's how things are going now. Now, in terms of editing a picture, you can increase its brightness and contrast from corrections, right? Uh, you can just go to picture corrections down here and there it has, you can just kind of specify how much brightness you want, how dark you want it. And you could also increase or decrease contrast however you like it, right? Another thing that you can do is you can make it black and white. So saturation means uh, when you say desaturate, desaturate means taking away all the color. So it makes it black and white. And this is full color in it. So it becomes super colorful, almost pixelates at some points. You could change the color tones of your picture if you'd like from here. Now, you also have something called artistic effects where you can make it blurred, you can make it a watercolor painting sort of a thing. So you can try these artistic effects. I try not to use them because I've just never needed them to enhance pictures. Uh, like we will talk about transparency in some time. Another thing that you can do with images on PowerPoint is you can remove their backgrounds. So if I have an image which has a single color background, meaning this background is just the same shade of green, all I have to do is go back to picture format, go to color, and you'll see something called set transparent color. Set transparent color picks up any one color in your image and makes it transparent. So I can just click it and drop it on the green. But it's not like I can go back to set transparent color and put it on another color. No, it removes only one color in the entire picture. So it can remove this background. Another kinds of picture that you might find is just uh, a picture that is, does not have a single color background. As you can see, this is not a single color background. It's a mix of different colors of cream and you know grays and all of that. Now, if I want to remove a background here, all I do is go to remove background. Everything that is pink is going to go away. It is going to vanish. So see, it's gone. It's become a PNG. Now, how do I bring back his face and everything? So there's something called mark areas to keep and mark areas to remove. So I say mark areas to keep and I draw a line across the area that I want back. So I want these parts back and I'm drawing a line across it. If I want to remove something, I just go to mark areas to remove and remove that part from this picture. And now it's a PNG with his face, but no ears, right? So if there is ever a time that you want to remove a uh, background from a logo or something, uh, you don't need a graphic designer for it. You can use it, uh, do it in PowerPoint itself, uh, right? 
So let me show you this particular slide. It looks like there is a watercolor kind of a texture on my image, but if I show you the actual real images that are on it, it's more or less like this. So there are two images, one which is a watercolor background. It's in, it doesn't have any transparency. And also there's another image here. So what I've done is I can take, I can take any backgrounds that have sort of some texture in them. And all I have to do then is go to picture transparency and then increase the transparency of this particular background to whatever, uh, so as much texture I want, I can keep increasing or decreasing the transparency. So you see, this is a completely opaque one. And then as the transparency increases, it almost disappears. So you could do this. Say you had, you wanted to make a presentation which is more technology based. You could find your background, the, the top image, the top layer to be a tech background, you know, uh, and then you could use transparency with that. So that's a cool way to um, enhance uh, slides in a presentation. So this kind of comes in handy when you're making uh, a presentation where when you're making your concept slides. And a lot of times we just put our images, you know, there's, uh, and then we put our text, but it always, always helps to put in that one extra touch so if you're making a tech presentation, try to add a tech texture to it, technology texture to it. If you're making a, a nice artistic presentation, try and I add a paintbrush uh, uh, background texture to it. You know, if you were making like a nice, uh, fun, youthful um, presentation, it could just be nice, colorful shapes on top of it or um, something called Memphis. If you research, it's just little graffiti elephant uh, elements that you can use on top of your picture so very small little uh, you know touches that you could do to your images and they just uh, totally change in their look another really cool thing that i want to teach you all is uh, how to use merge so these are called sliced images so this image is sliced into three parts right uh, there are two ways of doing this. If you have a PowerPoint version that has something called merge, which I will show you. And then we will learn about um, a case where you do not have that particular tool. So let me bring in three shapes. Ideally, I like to keep the same shape because it just, it makes it more symmetrical, just more, it's prettier to work with. And it doesn't make it really abstract. I mean, it brings out the beauty of the picture a lot more. So I've just got three images and I've placed them decently close, not too far away, because I still want to be able to make sense of the picture uh, when I slice it amongst these shapes. Now, when I select all three shapes and I go to shape format, there is something called merge shapes at the extreme left. Either you will see merge shapes written or you will just see these two consent uh, these two circles uh, that are together and all i have to do is i need to combine them so i need to union them union makes it one shape you know how it works with the grouping so let me make a copy of this and show you when you group three objects right it's a group it's a single group but each of these three objects are individually editable also. So I can still increase the size of this one. I can still decrease the size of this one. I can change the uh, color for this one, right? I can still do all of these things in a group. But the moment I go to merge and union them, they become one object. I cannot singularly select any shape out of these. So now this is one object. So I have to union them, make it one object. And then when I do shape fill with the picture, it gets sliced. 
between the three and I remove the outline so that it becomes more apparent. So now you see the picture is divided amongst three shapes. Now, if you do not have merge, what happens is that you can still do grouping and then do shape fill with a picture. So I had just grouped that particular, those three shapes and I'm just doing shape fill now. Now the difference between a group and a merge is, this was the part where we merged it together, is when you go back to a picture format and you go back to crop, you are able to edit this picture. You are able to elongate it. You are able to move it around. You are able to make it bigger, smaller inside this thing and move it. So if I say that, okay, this is the part of the image that I want in these three. This is how I'm going to change it. But in a group, you are not able to do that. See the crop, you are not able to open up crop, which means you cannot now edit this shape, edit this image inside these shapes. That's the only disadvantage with group. Otherwise, slicing is totally possible. So this here is actually just, I've made three parallelograms and put in a picture inside them. That's how this has been achieved. Now these tricks that I've shown you about sliced images and background textures, my advice is not to use them across PPTs. Like if you have certain slides that you're only going to use a few times. So for example, you have a section breaker that you will put in between different sections or even your concept slides where you're really wanting to showcase your idea, you know, uh, that is where I would say you should use these tricks uh, of sliced images, uh, you know, in and uh, textures and all of that. Because Otherwise, if the whole PPT is like that, then there is no wow factor. It needs to be in some slides where so that it can be that high point of your presentation look, you know, um, but it still has to be in alignment with the shapes that you've chosen. So if, for example, your shape that you've chosen for your graphic language is squares, then I would use the sliced images uh, with squares. If it is, uh, you know, triangles or parallelograms, then I would use something like this. Now, with images, something else that we have uh, constantly worked with is making collages or mood boards, right? So for wedding presentations, you're making a lot of mood boards, even for conferences, sometimes you want to show um, the kind of colors and textures you're using. And so where did you get that inspiration from? That's why you make mood boards. Or there could be times when you're just doing a basic collage of pictures and for some reason, there is a very cliched way of making collages. It's just rectangles. A slide is full of rectangular pictures and that becomes a collage. Uh, but I feel that one, nobody ever said that a collage has to be full screen, like just filled with pictures on the whole slide. And secondly, they never said it has to be rectangular pictures, right? So if, if my uh, graphic language is square or rectangle based, sure, my collage can be like that. But if it is not, and if it is more fluidic, if I'm using circles as my graphic language, my mood board can also be, have uh, circular images, right? So I'm going to show you some inspirations that I find for mood boards. So like if you see in this particular slide, uh, all of the pictures are in parallelograms. Uh, so if, if my graphic language was triangular or parallelograms, I could use this because it comes from the same family. Also, not the whole slide has been used. There's some negative space between all of the pictures and there's some negative space on the top as well. And so we should be, you know, we should have that kind of breathing space for pictures for them to stand out. Something like this. Very, very basic. I could put text on the top, at the bottom. You know, I don't need to have 30 images to show a mood board. If I'm talking about colors or elements that I'm going to showcase in my concept, uh, I, I can just do with five images or even seven. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be, of course, a certain number, but uh, fewer images are also okay. 
So if you see this particular slide, they're all reference images uh, from, you know, different magazine layouts and uh, whatnot. So I try and look for mood board um, inspiration from photography websites uh, because I feel their portfolios are just the way they put their photographs. It's some really good inspiration. Also, I feel magazine layouts as references are just brilliant for uh, mood board references. And so this is one of them. I don't have a lot of pictures on the right side. Also, my uh, photographs don't have to be vertically aligned. They can also be horizontally aligned like that. Here, I mean, just to give a glimpse of all the pictures uh, is also part of the mood board. You could make it like that. And so you could use an, uh, a shape like this. It's very easy to create and you also have one like these. Um, so try and, you know, get away from the cliched way of uh, just making collages and putting pictures on slides. Uh, try and keep it consistent with the graphic language. For example, say your graphic language was circular. I'm just going to quickly show you an example. Um, I'm going to make a circle. And if you remember, we had done uh, something of a graphic where we said a circle you could use with the shape family of an arc. And so we're going to do that right now. So this is the graphic I'm going to use uh, for the graphic language. And say I'm going to make this, just copies of this across my slide. And if you remember the yellow node that we spoke about in the previous session, so I could make smaller circles, bigger circles, whichever way I wanted them to be. And now I can put pictures inside them, right? I can put photographs inside each of them to create my mood board. Also, for this background, I don't need to have like a plain white background, it could be a gradient, it could be a background that you can put in, uh, you know, a picture background or something like that. So it could just be a nice dark background or light, whichever color you want to keep it to be. And there you go, you can create a mood board that does not look like a mood board uh, and still gives out all those elements of all those pictures being together on one slide, right? So you can try and get away from the usual rectangular collages and move in to be more consistent with your graphic language. Okay, let's move on to the second part of slide enhancers, which is animations. I am not a huge fan of using a lot of animations in a PPT, but I feel like certain animations if used well uh, can totally uh, enhance your PowerPoint and make it very, very uh, dynamic. So just look at this slide and you'll see that the background is moving. Now at this time, my text could be coming on it and everything, but my background is in motion. So just to give you a few examples, firstly, in animations, you have four types. If I'm going to create an object and show you quickly, I have an object here and in animations, you have four types of animations. You have entrance animations, you have exit animations, emphasis animations and motion paths. So motion path is going from one point to another point on a certain path. And so now I don't use a lot of these unless there is absolutely like I know what is it that I want to achieve and then I understand, okay, this is the animation that will help me achieve that, then I will use it. So now if I'm trying to create a, a, a background that is in motion, right? I'm going to remove the animation for this from now and show you. 
So it actually looks like I'm really going to zoom out of my slide. So if this is my slide, this is how big this background is. Because when I want it to move from one point to the other, I still want it to cover the slide. It should not happen that this background moves from here to here and then this part of the slide is left blank, right? So I make it big enough so that even when I move it, the end position also covers the entire slide. So I go to motion paths because I'm trying to make it move from one point to another. I go to motion paths and now I can choose right now by default, it takes the down direction. If you see these two points here, the green point means the starting point and the red point means the end point. Also remember, all the animations take place from the center of the object, which means that this green point is actually the center of the starting position and the red point is actually the center of the ending position. So you see this really faint object, this is the end position. But you know what, I want it somewhere like this. So I can really see how this is going to be placed. So I want it placed like this. So I've just moved it around and now you see what will happen is that it will go in that direction. And with this motion path, I want to tell you about a few other things. One is the animation pane. So this pane is where you will see all the animations that you will put on that slide. So right now I have only one animation. I will put that animation. So with this motion animation, I want to share a few things about animations here. Uh, if you see this animation pane, so this animation pane is where you will see all the animations that you put in on your slide. Along with that, you see something called start. So when do you want to start this animation? Do you want to start it on click? You want to start it with the previous animation. So right now there is no previous animation. So with previous would mean it will start as the slide comes on. So I say with previous or it can be after previous. So it can be after the previous animation or it can be uh, in this case right after the slide comes. So the slide comes and then the animation begins, right? So that's what it means. In order to slow it down, because right now, if you saw, this was moving super fast, right? If I want to slow it down, I can increase the duration. So I can say four seconds and now it will really slow it down, right? It's slowed down. Now, for example, I don't want, I don't want to click for this animation. Okay. I don't want it to come on click. I want it to come on its own but I want it to come after some time. So I want it to come after a few seconds, right? So I will, what I'll do is I'll increase the delay, which means there is a delay in when it begins. I'm going to make it more so that you understand how. So I put on the slide, I'm waiting. And now it starts moving because we added a delay to it, right? A few other things that you can do when you double click on the animation pane, you might be able to see this comes for almost all the animations. You can have a smooth start, a smooth end. You can also have a bounce end. So it kind of ends with a bounce. You could increase the time for that if you want it. And also if you want a sound with it. So if you want like an applause or like a camera click or something like that, you could add that if you'd like it. Uh, and that's about it. You could also repeat this particular animation. So you could repeat it as many times. So sometimes when you, uh, instead of motion path, if you did spin or something, then if you want to keep repeating that animation, you can use repeat as many times as you like. Okay, so this is about motion paths. Um, the entrance paths are very, uh, entrance uh, animations are extremely basic. You have fade, fly in, but all, those, all of these things of start with previous, after previous, the duration, the delay, remains the same for all animations, right? I'll show you an example of another slide uh, where you see that a car is being revealed. So, for example, if you're looking at this particular slide, you see that the car is being revealed. How is this happening, right? So, 
I can I can imagine that the animation being used here is a split, right? So when I when I go through all the animations, I know that this particular thing is achieved using a split animation. But this is an object that is going away, meaning it is exiting my slide. So I need to use an exit animation. So it is a split exit animation. But how am I getting this object? How have I made this object? Right? It's a dark um, silhouette of the same car. So here is how we do it. We basically, this is a PNG. Okay, so this is a PNG of the car and I have it on the road. Now, all I have to do is I need to make a copy of the car. And I'm going to make it really dark. So I'm going to go to corrections and I'm going to make it really dark in terms of uh, brightness and contrast. We'll reduce the brightness completely and make it fully dark. And now I can just place this car on top of my colored car. So now you don't see the colored car. The animation I need is very basic. I just need to add a split animation for exit. So here, now I have, and you have multiple effect options, like which direction do you want this split in? So you say vertically out. And so now all I have to do is press and it goes. So for reveals, for motion backgrounds, you know, uh, because with text coming in and, you know, headings flying in, I feel all of you know that it's very easy to kind of uh, place those things. But this, uh, these are things that you can think about when you're innovatively working with animation. In terms of placing animations for headings and text, like we did with colors and fonts, you can place these things in the slide master. The same things you can do with animation as well. So you, what we will do is we'll try and see how to place animations in slide master itself. Let's go to view and let's go to slide master. Now, if you see this, there is a heading and there is a text box. All I have to do is I go to the heading and I, I say that I want all my headings to fly in from the left. So I go to fly in and effect options. I say from left and now my headings will all fly in with previous because I don't want to click for it. And then my text box, I want it all to fade in. Okay and I say after previous. So if you see here now in animations, every sentence of the text box is going to come after the previous sentence and my heading is already taken care of. I go back to my slides and I'm going to choose this layout that we have. I'm going to put a title and I will say ABC. Right? I'm just going to make it bigger. And now without me doing anything, it's happening on its own. I haven't had to place a separate animation. And now when you see an animation pane here, you will see that there is a master title, there's a master body. So these are already in the slide master. So this reduces a lot of time. So I don't even put it in for body font. I just put it in for headings. If you want to do a fly in or a fade, you can place it in the slide master. Let's go into using transitions. Some of my favorite things uh, in PPT designing are working with transitions. In transitions also, you have a few uh, different kind of categories. So you have subtle, you have exciting, and you, you have dynamic. So Subtle are very just basic, you know, you have fade, you have push and you have like a basic cut and uh, split. In exciting ones, you have really nice uh, transitions. So let's just see quickly how these look. Uh, I'm going to close this so you can take a better look. So like with curtains, you have wind. Very dramatic ones also, you have uh, like fracture, but some of my favorite ones are uh, page curl. I like to use a page curl a lot. Uh, I like to use flip sometimes if I'm showing like data between two, um, you know, concept slides or something. 
in order to reveal a logo i try and use i like using vortex a lot even for head uh, title slides i like using it the good thing in transitions is that sometimes you can actually find transitions that can go with your graphic language so say your graphic language was uh, hexagons right and so you have something called a honeycomb that you could use for a hexagon hexagonal presentation or even with glitter you have hexagonal glitter in these effect options you have hexagons and you have diamonds also so if it was uh, if your graphic language was triangles i would i would use a diamond you could also use a hexagon there but you know so you have those choices here but the more interesting things that you can do with uh, transitions are making continuous slides let me show you how so i'm going to take you through a few slides and we'll talk about it so if this is the first slide and then i'm moving into the next slide you see that it looks like a scroll right it looks like a long page that you're just going into why does that happen firstly it happens because the background color of the two slides is the same so if i'm going from one slide into another the background is the same so it looks like one page scroll and the second is that there is a common element of this one uh, rectangular line that goes from this slide into this slide so just creating common elements between two slides and this is a basic push transition that i've used um, uh, that you could be using here now this here is a morph transition i just want to want you to see this particular video first and then we will talk about it so you see what has happened here you saw that there are multiple frames that it's going from if you see this it's everything is changing its position from one place to another how is this happening let me show you a transition that you might have if you do not have it don't fret there's no problem but if for example i'm i'm going to take a basic example of three shapes okay so this is my first slide that i might have pictures on or content on and i'm going to use the same shapes but change their sizes and positions so i'm going to change their size and positions also right so i'm just going to make it so from here it is this now what does morph mean morph essentially means transforming it into something else very uh, smoothly transforming into something else so like how uh, transformers movies you have robots going into cars and vice versa uh, that's called morphing into something else so now i want these this slide to morph into this slide all i have to do is i go to transitions and i say morph for this slide now when i'm moving from this slide into this slide it transforms into its next position it just goes from what it was into what it's going to be very smoothly earlier we used to just when we did not have morph we would do fade and so it would just go from here to here but with morph what it does is it makes a very smooth transition so you could do this with shapes and under morph you have words characters you could work with that as well so this whole video i'm going to show it to you again is made with morph you see the triangles will move into their position the logo will move into its position so look at how the lines are moving and all i had to do was put in morph into this particular presentation um similarly when you use half the slide uh, for uh, an image and the other half uh, for text i try and keep the next slide as the opposite combination so i if my image is in the top half on one side and text is on the bottom half the next slide i keep as 
top half as text and bottom half as image. And then again, I've used a push transition between the two to create a more continuous look. You could do this with a left image and right text and then uh, right image and left text. Uh, okay, so that is some things that you can do, practically do uh, to include animations and transitions to your presentations. Let's move on to some media. So in terms of media, you can use music uh, and videos uh, in your presentations. In music, essentially, now I have a music track that I have here. Mm. I'm just going to reduce its volume so it's not too loud. Now, when I bring a music track, which I can do from insert audio, and uh, you can record an audio, you can also bring an audio from your computer. When you click on it, you see something called playback. Under playback, there's, uh, you will see trim audio where you can uh, just cut out a, the, a part of the audio that you'd like to use. So you, all you have to do is just this and it says, okay, now it's gotten cut. But sometimes when it gets cut abruptly and you want it to fade out really smoothly, what you want to do is you want to increase the fade out time or if you've cut it from the beginning, then you want to increase the fade in time. So then it sm starts smoothly and ends smoothly. You can fix the volume from here or also from here, you can fix it. Now, in terms of when you want this audio to play, it says start in click sequence, meaning if you have other animations that are playing on the slide, this sound will play in that click sequence. And I'll show you what I mean. And Otherwise, you have automatically or when it's clicked on. Usually, we say automatically we play, uh, put the sound uh, clip where we need it. And you say how hide during the show. This icon gets hidden during the show. Now, if you want this sound clip to play only on this slide, then play across slides is not checked. But if you want it to play across the PPT or across slide, you say play across slides. And if the soundtrack is too small, but you want it to keep playing, then you can say loop until stop. So it keeps on looping on its own, right? Now, when you go to, now this is a sound clip, but when you go to animations, you will see in the animation pane that I see this sound clip here, right? Now, I already have some animations on my slide master. So and this is after previous, meaning when all these animations get done, that's when this will play. But what I want to do is it should play from the beginning. So I'll say with previous. Also, when I double click on this track, it says start playing from wherever, but it also says stop playing on click after current slide or after so many slides. So if you have 10 slides that you want this track to play through, then you just say it should stop playing after 10 slides. So it will not, it will not play beyond 10 slides, right? So you can specify that timing. So that's about sound. In order to work with videos, so you again go to insert, you go to videos. If you bring in an online video, you need to have internet when you're presenting, right? It puts in uh, the thumbnail of that video here, but you have to have internet when you're presenting in order for it to play. But, or you can just say video from my PC. Now I have a video that's right here, right? But I wanted to play with previous. I, want, I wanted to start with previous. And what I also want is that it should, now I can also, again, you can trim the video also. You want to cut out a part of it, you can do that. You can fade it in, fade it out. You want to start it automatically or when clicked on. You can also play it full screen if you'd like, so it stretches itself. Uh, also, a video, you can edit like you can edit an image, okay? So in image, you have brightness, contrast, color, uh, you can do shadow and all of that. So I can make the video brighter, um, you know, like that. I can also give it a shape. So say I want to put my video in a parallelogram or I wanted to put it in a circle for some reason. So then I could do that, you know, I could also give my video a border, a shadow. So anything that you can do with a shape, 
you can do with the video. You can also crop it out. So if you wanted to crop out part of the video, you can do that as well, right? So anything that you can do with uh, an image, uh, basic editing, you can do with the video as well. Now, I'm just going to show you a sample of what can be done with using videos in backgrounds, uh, using sound effects and uh, other transitions and animations. Let's take a look. The beginning part of it essentially has, if you see, this is a video clip and there's a sound that goes with it. There's a glitch track that I found online that goes with it. And this kind of, this kind of lines animation is called random bars animation that you have, right? Uh, also these, this is a random bars animation. And then this is just a video background, right? All of these are just objects are just flying in and then there's cube transition or uh, cover transition or flip transition that I've used in between slides. So that's what you can do with a PPT. And then all I've done is just save the whole PPT as a video. Let's move on to the reference wardrobe. So how do you look for the correct references for your presentations? You know, all of these places that I've written here, you have brand websites, you have brand brochures, uh, you have Google, Invato, and Freepik, uh, Shutterstock. You don't need um, accounts on any of these for references because we're not going to download the exact files from here. We're just looking for something we can take inspiration from, right? So I always try and make a folder of all my inspirational JPEGs that I can find uh, when I start making a presentation. So when I decide, okay, my presentation, presentation is going to be really sharp and, you know, very sleek, then I look for magazine layouts that are super sharp and very like, you know, very smart uh, layouts. And I put them in a folder to replicate later in a presentation. Let's take a look at what are the different kinds of slides that you have in a PPT and how you, sh you should start approaching them now. When you start making a PPT, you, you begin from the title slide and then you go on slide by slide designing it. And that's why it takes us so much time because we keep doing hit and trial of how we should make it. And that's why there is no consistency also sometimes. And then it also takes a lot of time for us. So here's what you have to do. Whenever you make a presentation, I can assure you that all the presentations, all the slides that you've ever made, they fall into the categories of these slides, right? So you have a title slide, you have concept slides that might be using those tricks that we learned, sliced images or textures, uh, reference slides, reference images plus text slides, meaning, uh, for example, if you're making a registration slide, so you have a few renders of uh, the giveaways uh, that you're giving them, maybe the costume of the hostesses or anything that you have to specify there. So those are reference images or uh, created plus some text along with it. Then there are slides which have only like one big creative and very little text or maybe just a title. So you have a set design or something. Then there are slides which are section breakers. So if you're doing a day one, day two, day three kind of PPT, you put a section breaker between each section. Uh, mood boards, collages, number slides, I mean charts uh, or number uh, tables, you know, bar graphs, anything like that. And then timelines if necessary. So I would say all of the presentations that you will ever encounter in events, these are the types of slides that you will find. And not all PPTs have all types of these slides. You will probably have three to four types of slides. So when you begin making a presentation, you should figure out from the flow that you just made of the presentation, you will get to know, you know what, I'm only making a concept PPT. So I just need a title slide and concept slides um, reference. 
if i'm making a ppt which is full fledged then i might need section breaker also i might need uh, reference images plus text also so what all are the references that i need right you have to figure that out first and you already have a graphic language by now so you've already thought of if you want to use circles you want to use square or what you want to use so let's go into how to find these things right let's look at this website it's a food website what are the things that stand out to you the fact that they've used squares and rectangles for text um and you know picture boxes they've used a mustard color in terms of outline for heading even for their boxes some places right and they've also kept an element of circle if you see like all their images are very circular because it's plates of course but they've kept that element of fluidity also in some places and the fact that they have a dark background so in terms of if you had to ever use textures you could look for dark textures for this you know that you want to use a square uh, graphic language which means now when you look for uh, graphic language options you will look for square infographics or something like that let me show you something online now if you remember uh, we had spoken about stylizing a shape when you decide uh, your graphic language uh, you want to also figure out how you're going to stylize the shape now as per that particular ppt that we just saw i have just typed square infographic in free pick and now you can see that there are so many of these references that you can find of how a square can be stylized right so you can have just a solid color um, so but these are great kind of references to make your section breakers and all of that so if you had to make something like this it is very simple to recreate using shapes now right you just break it down into shapes or even if you were looking at something like this this is rounded rectangles but you can make it using squares or rectangles as well but this becomes a great uh, section breaker for you and you can pick up uh, the shape from here itself uh, i've just gotten that reference from there right and i'm just going to say okay if i have if i'm taking the reference from here my text slides and i'm just taking this graphic as a as an inspiration then my text slides can be something like this where you if you have a big creative in the background even for my concept i could uh, you know make this even bigger if i needed to and work with something like this you know it's a big block and i'm not a big fan of blocks but this could be your section breaker or your title slide or something like that uh, and if you only had to kind of put some text i could even make it more transparent but i've taken some inspiration from here itself right so that's a very basic inspiration that i've taken and because you see here it's so so simple as a website they've made it i could just pick up this website's layouts to make my ppt also but it's in line with this website which means the client will connect with it instantly right so that's what we mean by taking correct references from online to make your slides so just remember that you have to approach your ppts from the viewpoint of these types of slides and not slide by slide if you want to save massive time on making a ppt thank you so much for being part of this session i hope you all move forward to working with making your own graphic languages and creating very very creative powerpoint presentations thank you